the Lord is good. One of the great joys of being in the ministry for 45 years, I don't believe that myself, but it's true. I, I'm really not old, I, I'm just a young model with a lot of miles on me. But one of the joys is to look back over four decades and a half and uh, remember people that you've known in the past. And tonight out in the hall, I was speaking to some people and two young ladies walked up and said, do you remember us? And I looked in their faces and the faces were so familiar, but I hadn't seen them for 20 some years. And I started to say, remind me, and ah, it came to me. Those are the Lorem sisters who were young people in Washington Park when I was pastor there. Uh, where are those young ladies? They're here tonight. There they are, back in the back. I'm so glad you're here. They are, uh, it's just a delight to see back 40 years and to know that those that you sought to minister to are still going in the Lord. And it just gets no better than that. The Varners, where are the Varners? There they are. My goodness. Oh, yes, I remember Bev and Jim. Well, Terry and Mopsy, good to see y'all. My goodness, we're having a old uh, homecoming of uh, First Baptist Church of Washington Park in East St. Louis. That is fantastic. Good to see y'all. Y'all look so good. Uh, it is... Terry doesn't. <laughs> Ter Terry's lost a little bit of his hair. <laughs> you can only see it when I turn around in the back. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it fantastic? Let me encourage some of you uh, younger preachers. Uh, keep on being faithful. Uh, we had a tremendous group of young people there just fantastic and uh, to see them go on and serve the Lord. I, I, I so much appreciate y'all being here. Anybody else from my past? I mean that that, that, <laughs> <laughs> that will uh, say nice things and not, <laughs> and not reveal any things. <laughs> All right. Uh, we had a couple here last night uh, in uh, Fred and Kathy Smith. So this is great. And, and I'm so encouraged to see so many uh, young people here and uh, some, some from Hannibal LaGrange and Missouri Baptist. Well, that's fantastic. Couldn't get better than this. Turn your Bibles to Romans 4. I didn't come here to uh, reminisce, but it is good to reminisce. It brings tears to your eyes to think about how good God was back in those days. And uh, these are still going on for the Lord. Romans chapter 4, as we begin reading at verse 1. Romans chapter 4. We'll read the first 10 verses and skip down to verse 23. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath something of which to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in, uncir not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Then jump down to verse 23. Now it was written for not written for his sake alone, 
that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Father, you are good, so good to such sinners as we are. Thank you for all that we have in the Lord Jesus. And thank you that we have moments like this together where we can fellowship around the Word of God, where we can sing praises to your name. We pray tonight that you will speak by the power of your Holy Spirit through the Word of God for your glory. And we leave the ministry of the Word in your hands tonight because we have no power to do anything at all except you speak and move. We commit this in Jesus' name. Amen. My subject tonight is justification by faith alone. Several years ago, I ran across a quiz on justification which would determine whether a person held a Reformation view of justification or a Roman Catholic view. Now, let me give you that quiz tonight just rather quickly. The one that uh, I ran across had 10 questions. I'm going to give you seven questions. It's a multiple choice quiz. My students always like multiple choice better than anything else because you might just stumble upon the right answer. But I think a crowd like this can handle a quiz like this one. So here it is. You take a choice on each of these. Now write it down because I'm not going to grade it until we get to the end of the message. So follow along. Here is your quiz. Are you a Roman Catholic in your view of justification? Or do you hold a biblical or what we call a Reformation view of justification as a doctrine? All right, here it is. God A justifies a man by mercifully accounting him innocent and virtuous on the basis of the work of Christ. Or B, God justifies a man on the basis that he actually makes him into an innocent and virtuous person. Now, this is a no-repeat exam. So you'd better get it the first time. Number two, we are justified A, by faith alone. Or B, by faith alone when it becomes active by love. Number three, now don't anybody raise your hand and say, would you repeat that? Nope, can't repeat. Number three, A, if a man is born again, he will because of that new birth, receive right standing with God. Or B, if a man receives right standing with God by faith, the new birth is present as well. Number four, we are justified, A, by having Christ live out his life of obedience in us, or B, by accepting by faith that he obeyed the law of God perfectly for us. Number five, a, we are justified by faith by following Christ's example by the help of his enabling grace. Or B, we follow Christ's example because we have been justified by faith. Number six, A, God justifies us and then gives us his spirit to make us godly. Or B, God sends his spirit to make us godly and then he declares that we are good and acceptable in his sight. And number seven, A, only by faith in the doing and dying of Christ can the claims of the Ten Commandments upon us be satisfied. Or B, by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we can fully satisfy the claims of the Ten Commandments against us. You know, I've used this simple exam. I'm going to say some things right now, and that's why we're not going to grade it, because you might get either elated so much that you will uh, not listen anymore or so discouraged that you would shut me off. But I've used this simple exam in many places, and you would be surprised at the number of people who claim to be reformed in their doctrine, orthodox Christians, but yet as they answer these questions, they're Roman Catholic in their view of justification. They are not biblical. They do not hold to the Reformation view 
of justification by faith. Try it sometimes. Maybe tomorrow we can make this little quiz available to you if you want to take it with you. I guess you've got a Xerox machine here or something like that that will do the job. But just, just ask people sometime. Define for me the doctrine of justification. And I've done it, and you would be surprised the answers you get. Oh, it's, it's to believe in Jesus. Or, it's to experience Christ. Or, well, well it's to be saved. That's justification. Or, 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 that's what saves you when you get justified. Or, it really changes your life. Or, to get a little more nebulous and experiential, it's the greatest experience that one can have. Or again, oh, that's what every Christian needs. Or, you really get fuzzy, it's beyond definition. <laughs> you can only experience it. Or, still fuzzy, it's something that happened to me, but I can't define it. Or some have even said, it's the new birth. So my subject tonight is a much needed one. Martin Luther said, and someone referred to it, and I think he was right when he said it, that justification is the article which determines if the church is standing or falling. And if you'll begin to ask people to define justification, you will find, no doubt about it, the church is falling today. If John MacArthur is right when he says that every significant revival since the 16th century has been marked by a strong emphasis on this doctrine, if he's right when he says that, then we're not in revival and we're not even close to it. Because the doctrine of justification is simply not understood. Well, how shall we come to this doctrine tonight? I found sometimes in preaching and teaching it's best to deal with the a doctrine by setting forth the primary errors concerning it. And in the process, you're able to point out more clearly the truth. So this is going to be our method tonight. I want to point out the primary errors today concerning the doctrine of justification. And I trust in the process we will come to see very clearly what justification really is. I'm going to speak first of all in my first point, and here's where I tell you where I'm going, and then when I get done, I'll tell you where I've been. Justification by faith is not infused grace, but it's imputed righteousness. Second, justification by faith will never separate justification from sanctification completely. And again, justification by faith not only properly distinguishes the two, but it properly relates the two. Now you say, I don't know where you're going yet. All right, then let's get going and we'll find out. First of all, justification by faith. Primary error number one, justification is not infused grace, but justification is is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ to sinners who look to him by faith. Now what is infused grace? What am I talking about? Well, the Roman Catholic view says that God infuses his grace into a man. And that gives them, the man the ability to cooperate with that grace of God. He cooperates with God. He performs good works. And as that man, by that infused grace, performs good works, then God receives or accepts such a man as he performs those good works, he's performing those good works by God's power of the infused grace. And God's grace working in him, enabling him, enabling him to do good things, is the basis upon which God accepts him as righteous in his presence. Infused grace, enabling a man to do good works, whereby God then accepts him on the basis of those good works. Now what is imputed righteousness? Imputed righteousness is that God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to the bankrupt sinner's account 
not on the basis of any works the sinner does, but on the basis of faith alone in the work of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, which one is scriptural? Romans chapter 4, if you'll come back to that section of scripture with me. And it begins with that very question, how was Abraham justified? Or how was it that God accepted Abraham as a righteous man? How is it that Abraham was able to have fellowship with God? He was a sinner. How could a sinner have fellowship with God? On what basis? If Abraham was justified by works, he has a right to boast, but not toward God. In other words, if it's by works that a man is justified, then Abraham can boast, but he doesn't boast of the grace or the glory of God. He boasts of his own power and his own ability to please God. So if Abraham was justified by works, he's got a right to boast over how good he is because he's done enough good works for God to accept him. Verse 3, but what does the scripture say? Scripture says Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God, and that faith was reckoned to him for righteousness. Now, the word reckoned here means that his faith was credited to his sinful account for righteousness. His faith is what brought the righteousness of God to his backward, sinful, bankrupt account as he stood as a sinner in the presence of God. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or accounted, credited to his sinful account because of his faith. On the basis of his faith, it was accounted for righteousness. Notice verse 4. The reward is not credited, that is, the reward or crediting this righteousness to his account. The reward is not accounted by grace to the one that works. But, and here's our strong adversity again we saw last night, but it's by debt. In simple words, if it's works that brings salvation to Abraham, then salvation is not by, by the grace of God. If salvation is by one working, 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 then it's not by, by the grace of God. It's that God owes Abraham something. And when Abraham did good works, God said, all right, you've done good works, I'll pay it off. Now you're a righteous man because you've done good works. You've earned it. And the Bible says that's not the way. Verse 5. But to the one working not, but who believes on the one justifying the ungodly, the faith of him is reckoned for righteousness. It's grace, not works, but it's grace whereby a man believes and on the basis of that faith, his account is paid off by the righteousness of God. It's by faith. Faith is reckoned for righteousness, and righteousness is reckoned to that sinful account so that a man will be able to come into the presence of God and have fellowship with God. Verse 6, even as David also speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God reckons righteousness, how? Apart from works. God's reckoning a man to be righteous is not based upon his works, but God reckoning a man to be righteous is based upon faith and faith alone. Verse 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And that's a double negative in the Greek. Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin or recognize his sin. Blesses a man to whom God will never, ever, under any circumstance, at any time, any place, anywhere, impute to a man sin. That's my translation of a double negative. A double negative in the Greek is an emphatic no, an emphatic negative. Blessed is a man to whom God will never, ever, under any circumstance, at any time, any place, anywhere, impute to him sin. 
Why? Because he has the blessedness of justification by faith. And then verse 9. Is this blessedness of justification upon the circumcision or on the uncircumcision? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Verse 10, how then was it reckoned when he was in circumcision or when he was in uncircumcision? Not when he was in circumcision, but when he was in uncircumcision. It was not when Abraham was doing the religious rites or doing good works that God accounted him to be righteous by faith. But it was on the basis completely, absolutely, undeniably, by faith and by faith alone. And then jump down to verse 22 in chapter 4. Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. It was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom righteousness shall also be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So it's faith that puts righteousness to our credit when we are so bankrupt in sin. Just like Abraham. Abraham was saved by faith alone apart from works. And we are saved by faith alone apart from works. And then Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith and by faith alone. And verse 9 of Romans 5, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now I challenge you to read that fourth chapter of the book of Romans. Read it, study it carefully. Where is it that you will find infused grace? Where is it you'll find that God poured his grace into a man's heart and a man was able to do good works and on the basis of those works God declared him to be righteous in his presence? You'll not find it. What from works? You'll look in vain. You'll not find it. You will not find it. You'll only find the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us by faith, by faith alone, apart from any works of the law, apart from any works we might do or would hope to do. Now, I like to illustrate it this way. Illustration is worth a pound of talk. And I said last night, illustrations are good when you're illustrating on the basis of Scripture. Suppose I had a debt down at the bank of $10 billion. We just as well make it big. I couldn't say a million, but you know, I couldn't even any more pay a billion than 10, a million than 10 billion. Suppose I had down at the bank a debt of $10 billion. I couldn't pay it. But suppose someone else went down there and paid my debt of $10 billion. Would the bank still hold me accountable for that debt? No. Did I do anything to work so that debt would be paid? No. Someone simply because they loved me. I've never found anybody yet that loves me worth $10 billion or even a million. If somebody loved me that much and gave it to me, I'd probably give it to missions. <laughs> But it's not, it's not anything that I have done. In fact, I didn't even know it was being done in this instance. But somebody paid the debt, and the bank now writes that debt paid in full. And I have a, I have a perfect standing down at the bank. I'll never get another bill. <laughs> I'll never get another reminder that I'm way, 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 way overdrawn. I'll never be reminded of that again. The vacation is. When I, a sinner, with a debt of sin so large, so great, so massive, so deep, so high, so abundant, I couldn't pay it. Could you pay your sin debt? Is there any way you could ever pay your sin debt? And yet, Jesus Christ came to this earth and paid my sin debt. And when I look away from myself and I look to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, God takes the righteousness of Christ and his righteousness covers my debt of sin. 
and I am justified, declared to be righteous by God. It's a legal transaction at the throne of God. Now get this clear. It's a legal transaction at the throne of God. It is not something subjective. You don't experience justification by faith. By the grace of God and through the power of regeneration, you are able to put your faith in Christ. But you don't experience justification. You experience regeneration, yes. But God doesn't justify you on the base of, basis of regeneration. God justifies you on the basis of the righteousness of Christ. And it takes place at the throne of God, and you don't experience justification. It's at the throne of God. It's, it's objective. It's not subjective. If anybody says, Woo, I just experienced justification. No, no, you don't experience justification. You may experience the results of justification, but you don't experience justification. It takes place at the throne of God. It's instantaneous. It's not a process. It's objective. It's not subjective. It's not experiential. It's, it is not experiential. It's non-experiential. It's judicial at the throne of God. It's by faith, not by works. It's irreversible, irrevocable. It's for all of eternity. Now, sanctification is the process after you've been justified, whereby you now become more holy in life and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But I say it again, justification is instantaneously, by the grace of God, the moment you put your faith in Christ, the righteousness of Christ is placed to your sinful account and you are declared, you are declared, you are declared by God to be righteous. Somebody says, but I'm not righteous. And that's what Luther talked about when he used the phrase simul use to set peccator. Luther said, I'm a sinner and a saint at the same time. The reality of it is I am a sinner, still a sinner, even after a, God has declared me to be righteous. But when God sees me tonight, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see me anymore as a wicked, rotten, vile, filthy, depraved, corrupt, hell-bound sinner that I was. But he sees me in Christ. The righteousness of Christ has been placed to my sinful account. And God sees me tonight. And God declares, Richard Belcher is a righteous man based upon the righteousness of my son and based upon faith and faith alone. He couldn't work for it. He couldn't earn it. He couldn't gain it for himself. It came when he simply looked away from himself, the sinner, and cast himself by faith on Christ's righteousness. And Christ's righteousness has been placed to his sinful account. And now I look down at Richard Belcher and I declare him to be a righteous man. That's justification. That's just, it's not experiential. You don't jump up and down, hoop and holler when you get justified. Now you might jump up and down, hoop and holler when you realize you are justified. The sins are gone. Not infused grace, but the imputed righteousness of Christ. An instantaneous process. Not subjective, but objective at the throne of God. It's non-experiential. It's by faith alone, apart from works. But second, primary error number two. We must never synthesize justification and sanctification. The error number two is to take justification and sanctification and bring them together and see them as one rather than to keep them separate. We must not synthesize them. We must keep them separate. Now, the Bible does teach sanctification. You can't deny that. Romans chapter 8 talks about walking in the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the flesh. That's part of growth and sanctification. The Bible speaks rather clearly about the fact that we as newborn babes are to desire the pure milk of the Word. That's, if you're a newborn babe and you can grow, then the growth is sanctification. I'll not take time to prove that to you. There, there, there are an abundance of verses. Even Paul prayed that 
The Philippians may grow in their love. That's sanctification. There are commands and challenges and instructions whereby we can be godly, become godly, grow in Christ. That's, that's, sanct that's sanctification. But you see what Roman Catholics do. They take sanctification and justification and make them into one. There is no distinction in Roman Catholic theology between sanctification and justification. And that's because of their view of infused grace. When God infuses grace into you, then you begin to do the good works. In order that God might accept you, the question comes, how many good works do I have to do? How, how much of these good works? God, I'm trying awful hard. You've infused your grace into me, and I'm really working at it, trying to be holy, trying to be godly. But, but, but how long, how much, how many of good works do I do before I'm, I'm, I'm accepted and declared to be righteous before you? Wasn't that Martin Luther's problem? He longed to be accepted of God. He longed to be holy in the presence of God. He did everything to reach that assurance and that status where he knew that God had accepted him, where he knew that he was holy before God. But he never came to such an understanding because it was a false doctrine. He was operating under the Roman Catholic doctrine. God has infused his grace into me, and so I work and work and work and work and work and work. But even then, the Roman Catholic doctrine said you had to keep on working, and you might even die and never know. And you might even have to go somewhere else and, and somehow work out your salvation through some suffering. There was no assurance because they welded justification and sanctification. They didn't see that justification took place on the basis of faith and faith alone. And sanctification would follow. They simply put them together and infused grace. You worked for it and then God would declare you righteous. But I doubt if you could have, could have found a man in Martin Luther's day who would, was able to say, I've done enough and I know I'm justified in the presence of God. And is this not why the doctrine of justification by faith alone apart from works was so glorious to Luther? It was truth that caused him to see the futility of his works. It was truth that pointed him to faith in Christ alone. It was this truth that revolutionized his life and his work. It was this truth that finally brought true joy and peace to his heart. It was this truth that armed him to assail the falsehood of the theology of his day. It was the truth of justification by faith and by faith alone. And yet, can you imagine that some people today want us to recognize the Roman Catholic doctrine has equal with ours? No different from the biblical doctrine we preach. They hold a, 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 an acceptable view of justification. Some want us to forget the years of battle, the battle for truth, and somehow sell out to the falsehood of infused grace rather than imputed righteousness. Some want us to forget the creeds and the documents of the Roman Catholic Church, which have never been revoked, which can never be revoked, which set forth without doubt infused grace salvation by the works of man creeds and documents which set forth and continue to set forth the fact that we who believe in justification by faith and by faith alone are anathema doomed to an eternal damnation some want us to stop seeking to evangelize Roman Catholics they have faith we're told there are so many others who are clearly lost go to them don't talk to Roman Catholics time to bury the hatchet with the Roman Catholic Church. Well, I never had a hatchet for Roman Catholics. All I've got for any man is the gospel. And I can't say Roman Catholics or anybody else isn't saved. But the Bible is the one that does the judging. And I'm not judging anyone. I'm simply preaching the gospel. And I don't care whether it's Baptists or Roman Catholics or charismatics, or whoever else it might be, if they do not believe in the doctrine of justification by faith alone apart from works, then they must be judged by the Scripture as being wrong. 
the book, that's what will judge us. And it's my duty to seek to evangelize to everyone and anyone. I'll give the gospel to Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists, Independents, Pentecostals, Roman Catholics. What am I supposed to do before I witness? Uh, are you a Baptist? Yes. Oh, well, I can't witness to you if you're a Baptist. Well, are you a Presbyterian? Yes. Yes, I'm a Presbyterian. Well, I can't witness to you. You're a Presbyterian. Or, or, or are you a Roman Catholic? Yes. Well, I can't witness to you. You're a Roman Catholic. Suppose I'm witnessing and the person evidences a work salvation mentality and I'm ready to give them the gospel and they say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a Baptist. Well, I can't witness to you. You're a Baptist. Well, they say, I'm a Roman Catholic. I can't witness to you. You're a Roman Catholic. Would it offend me if a Roman Catholic tried to witness to me? No, because we'd talk about the gospel. It wouldn't offend me. Or would it offend me if a Roman Catholic would witness to one of my church members? No, it wouldn't, wouldn't offend me. I'll share the gospel with anyone. And I have an obligation to share the gospel with anyone. And I don't care if it's a Baptist. If they don't have the answers given in Scripture, then I'll share the gospel with the Baptist. If they don't believe in justification by faith and by faith alone, then they need the gospel because they don't know the gospel. They don't have the gospel. The only reason there is some fear of witnessing to Roman Catholics is because there is a difference between our doctrines. For if there were no difference, who would be offended at a witness? So the doctrine of justification by faith is not infused grace. And it's not what I call confused grace. Infused grace is the first one. Confused grace is the second one, where you somehow bring justification and sanctification together and don't separate them and see that justification is separate. But primary error number three, though we must separate justification and sanctification, we cannot, in another sense, separate completely justification and sanctification. You following me? Salvation is not by the infused grace of God is by the imputed righteousness of Christ. Salvation cannot come if we weld the two together. We must see that justification and sanctification are two different doctrines. And by justification we're declared righteous before God and by sanctification we grow in that righteousness. The righteousness to become like Christ. But at the same time, though we separate the two, we don't separate them to so completely that we say you can have justification, but you don't necessarily have to conclude that sanctification is going to follow. Let me see if I can clarify this issue. There is a clear distinction in the definition of the doctrines of justification and sanctification. There is a clear distinction in the application of the doctrines, but there's no separation in the possession of the doctrines, which is to say, if you possess justification, you will also be participating in the work of the Holy Spirit known as sanctification. If you have one, you will have the other. You cannot separate the two in that fashion. You cannot have justification without possessing sanctification. And you cannot have sanctification without possessing justification. There's a difference in definition and application, but not a difference in possession. They're not the same. But I guarantee you, if you have one, you'll have the other. You say, preacher, where do you get that in Scripture? Well, I guess my, my, my primary text would be James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, where James says in verse 17 that faith without works is dead. A true faith, a true saving faith, James says, will be followed by works. Faith without works is dead. 
Now, some people get a little bit worried here because they think James and Paul contradict each other. The problem is that James and Paul use the same three words. James and Paul both use faith, works, and justification. But I challenge you to study and you'll find out that they use these three words with different definitions. And if you take Paul's definitions of these three words, faith, works, and justification, and press them on James, then you're going to have a contradiction in the Bible. Paul is talking about a justification before God. Faith for Paul is the act of faith, not a work. It's a gift of God. It's the act of the whole man, not just of the mind, emotions, or of the will alone, but of the whole man, mind, will, and emotions. And it's that kind of faith that brings true justification, according to Paul. And for Paul, justification is by faith, and it's not by works. And the works he's talking about here are works of the law, works of the flesh, the works of the natural man, which will supposedly and hopefully bring salvation. And Paul says they won't. So justification for Paul is before God. Faith is the full-orbed faith of the whole man. And works are the works of the law and the works of the flesh. Now you press these words on James and you're, you're in trouble. So how does James use these words? Well, I'm convinced as I study this passage that James is speaking of a justification that's before men. Before men, not a justification before God. And notice in James chapter 2, Abraham was declared to be righteous before men. I would translate it that way. He was justified, declared to be righteous before men when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. That settled it. James is, a, is, is saying Abraham was proven to be a righteous man when he... It didn't make him a righteous man, but he was proving before other men that he was a righteous man when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Up to this time... In Genesis 22, Abraham's life was kind of checkered. He went down to Egypt, weakness of faith. He lied in Egypt, weakness of faith. He committed adultery with Hagar, weakness of faith. He laughed at God, weakness of faith. He had a lapse at Gerar, weakness of faith. I'm not sure what I might have thought about Abraham in that day if I'd have sat there with a New, New Testament type of Bible and, and, and wondered about whether he was justified or not. Is he a godly man? Is he a righteous man? Even if I was an Old Testament saint, is Abraham a godly man? Is Abraham a just man? Is Abraham a righteous man before God? In James 2.22, notice it carefully. Do we not see how his faith wrought with his works? And by works, faith, the old King James says, was made perfect. But I think I would translate it, by his works, faith was consummated. Faith was brought to its end. Faith was brought to its goal. Faith was brought to its full purpose. Faith was brought to its full development. Faith was brought to its full culmination by works. When he offered his son Isaac upon the altar, his faith was brought to its purpose, its culmination. So James is not saying that Abraham was saved by works. I remember when I was back in high school, I had a, a girlfriend and God straightened my life out and so I began to witness to her about salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ and his his work for us and uh, her reply would be with but, but faith without works is dead I kept trying to tell her it's not by works but faith without works is dead and I tried to witness to her mother and her mother said faith without works is dead sometimes when people come to my door and I try to witness to them you know some of those folks that knock on your door you tell them salvation by grace through faith alone and what Christ has done at Calvary's cross, his righteousness imputed to my sinful account. But faith without works is dead. But faith without works is dead. But James is not saying that Abraham was saved by works. He's saying rather that Abraham's saving faith was brought to its God-intended end as it produced true Christian works. Thus, God does not save us just to save us, but God has an intent, and the final intent is that we would practice godliness, righteousness. We would live holy lives. 
And that's the culmination of our faith. Faith without works is a dead faith. It's a false faith. It's a wrong faith. It is not a faith at all if it's a faith that has no works. So that's how I use the word justification. Declaration of righteousness before men. Faith. James 2, 19, thou believest there is one God, but thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. Here he says that the devil is, is capable of faith. So it's, it's not the full-orbed faith of Paul. It's the one-dimensional aspect, the mental aspect. The devil does believe that God exists, but he doesn't believe with a commitment. He doesn't believe with the commitment of his will. Obviously enabled by God. The devils only believe and tremble. They have a mental knowledge of God. They have an emotional aspect of faith? No. The, the demons only have a mental knowledge that God exists. There is no emotional aspect in their faith. There is no volitional aspect in their faith. The demons have never cast themselves upon God by a true faith. It's only a mental assent that God exists. So James uses the word faith or believe differently than Paul. What about works? Is it not obvious that James uses works here to speak of true Christian works? Faith without true Christian works. Paul is speaking of the works of the flesh, the works of the law that will bring me righteousness. James is speaking about true Christian works that will flow from a Christian who has true faith. And so they use the word works differently. Notice verse 14, What does it profit my brethren, though a man say he has faith? And he has not true Christian works. What, is, what good does it do for a man to say, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. I have faith, I have true faith. But he doesn't have true Christian works. What good is that? He's a liar. Or you can just go down the line there and read in James and just put the word in. Notice verse 17. Even so faith, if it has not true Christian works, is dead being alone. I would translate that word works there every place, true Christian works, because that's what he's... A faith, a proclamation of faith, if it doesn't have true Christian works, is dead. It's not a true faith. A true faith will be followed by sanctification. A true justification will be followed by sanctification. Verse 18, yea, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show you, I'll show you my faith by my true Christian works. Or again, verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without true Christian works is dead? Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by true Christian works? Declared to be righteous before the whole world by his true Christian works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his true Christian works and by his true Christian works, his faith was brought to its full and its complete culmination and purpose that God had ordained it to produce. Verse 24, you see then that by works, true Christian works, a man is declared to be righteous before men and not just by some profession of faith only. Now if you do anything else, verse 25 does the same. If you do anything else with that, you got problems. So, so notice, justification. Paul speaks of justification or declaration of righteousness before God. James speaks of declaration of righteousness before men. Faith. Paul speaks of the full-orbed biblical faith, saving faith. James speaks of a mental faith which falls short. And works. Paul speaks of the works of the flesh. James speaks of the works of a true faith, true Christian works that flow from true salvation or true justification by faith alone. Now, if, if, you, if you can't separate justification and sanctification, if, if everyone who's truly justified by faith and faith alone will bring the result of godly works or sanctification we as Southern Baptists are in trouble. We're in trouble. 
Our greatest problem is our large membership with few attending and few giving and few interested, but many inactive, many non-residents, some dead physically but still members. Some would even say these are just backsliders. Yeah, they slid all the way into the grave. And according to some people, you can get saved 50 years ago and spend the whole rest of your supposed Christian life as a backslider. When I was just a young preacher, I started a mission over here, Welland Springs Gardens Baptist Church. Over yonder here, somewhere through the woods. Everything's grown up so much around here, I don't know where I am. I can remember when St. Peter's just wasn't even St. Peter's. But I went down into that little community when I was a sophomore at Hannibal LaGrange College. I was pastor of a church outside of Troy, but had a burden to reach more people with the gospel. Went down to this little community where people had moved out from St. Louis. And they built little block houses. Began to knock on doors. They would invite me in. I'd tell them I was the preacher, and they would invite me in, and I'd go in and strike up a conversation. And then the question would come, are you saved? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, I'm saved. Well, that's great. Tell me about it. Well, about 20 years ago, down, they'd name some place. I'm not going to denigrate any place by naming it. <laughs> because they were from all over. Yes, we had a great revival. Brother so-and-so came through, and man, I got saved. I was there, I know it. I bawled and squalled and cried and went down the aisle, and oh, I, oh, I know I was saved. I know I was saved. Well, how are you doing with the Lord now? Well, not too good. And you look around you in the house, and you see the evidence of <laughs> not a godly life, but worldly, fleshly living. Well, what happened? Well, you know, we did pretty good for a month or two, and then we just kind of laid out. How long ago? 20 years ago. But I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Don't you know? If you're a Baptist, once saved, always saved. Nobody will ever be able to tell me I'm not saved. 20 years. Backslidden. Or lost. You know, I met so many of those folks. You know, I kind of believe that theology. But I met so many of those folks, I began to wonder. And so I went back home and began to study the Bible. And I came to the conclusion those folks are lost, probably. And so I began to approach them on that basis. But that's just a small area. We as Southern Baptists have been reproducing that for years and years and years and years and years. We have churches with a thousand members where 200 attend. We got a lot of folks who have made a profession of faith, but have never been saved. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but he that doeth the will of my Father who's in heaven. Oh, yes, I know Jesus. Oh, yes, I'm saved. Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Where are you on Sunday morning? Well, you know, we got other things to do. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Not everybody that calls me Lord is saved. But who is saved? He that doeth the will of his Father. That's the one that's saved. And it goes right along with what we've seen tonight. If you've truly been saved, justified by faith, alone apart from works, there will flow from your life. A godly work of God that's called sanctification. Now that doesn't mean you're perfect. Oh, sanctification can be a struggle. And I look back on my 45 years of ministry. I got straightened out with the Lord when I was a senior in high school. I look back on all those years and there have been some struggles and there have been some battles and there have been some battles I lost. But I never could get away from the Lord. He would always bring me back. Because if you've been justified by faith alone apart from works, there will come 
that godly work, that process. Justification is an instantaneous act of God where he declares you to be righteous. Sanctification is that process where God makes you into a godly person. And he doesn't receive you on the basis of your sanctification. But he receives you and declares you to be righteous on the basis of Christ's righteousness, which comes by faith and by faith alone. So it's not infused grace. It's the imputed righteousness of Christ. You can't put these two together. If you put these two together, then you're going to have infused grace and confusion. But you can't separate them so much that you say one can have justification and sanctification is optional those I think are the three greatest errors that you will find concerning the doctrine of justification those three errors now let me come back to the quiz as I close number one God justifies a man by mercifully accounting him innocent and virtuous on the basis of the work of Christ. Amen. B. Who? God justifies a man on the basis that he actually makes him into an innocent and virtuous person. See, that one is saying, infused grace makes me innocent and virtuous, and therefore God receives me. Each one of these is sort of an infused grace idea versus the imputed righteousness of Christ. So A is right. B, we're justified by faith alone. Amen. B is wrong. We're justified by faith alone when it becomes active by love. That's fusing justification and, and sanctification. So again, A is correct. Three, if a man is born again, he will, because of that new birth, receive right standing with God. Now, just to trick you here, I put the right answer, B. Good teacher does that. This one is saying that the new birth, regeneration, is the ground of our justification, and that's false. If a man is born again, he will, because of that new birth, because of the new birth, receive right standing with God. No, it's not because of the new birth. It's on the basis of faith and the work of Christ, not on the basis of the fact I've been born again. B is correct. If a man receives right standing with God by faith, the new birth will be present as well. Four, we are justified, A, by having Christ live out his life of obedience in us. That's infused grace. We're justified by Christ living out his life of obedience through us. And then God accepts us on the fact that we live it out. Christ lives it out. That's infused grace. B is right. We're justified by accepting by faith that he obeyed the law of God perfectly for us. Number five, A. We're justified by faith by following Christ's example by the help of his enabling grace. I'll read it again. We are justified by faith by following Christ's example by the help of his enabling grace. We're justified by faith as we follow Christ's example. That again is works. Infused righteousness. Or B is correct. We follow Christ's example because we've been justified by faith. Six, God justifies us and then gives us his spirit to make us godly. That's correct. By faith, God justifies us and his spirit is given to us and the spirit of God works this work of sanctification whereby we grow and become a righteous, godly person. B is wrong. God sends his spirit to make us godly and then declares that we are good and acceptable in his sight. That again, he sends his spirit to make us godly and because the spirit has made us godly inside of us, experiential, that's wrong. Because 
Justification is at the throne of God by faith in Christ's righteousness alone, not in anything God does for, anything God does in me or anything I do for God. It's based completely by faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and his work at Calvary. And again, it is an instantaneous act. It is at the throne of God. It is objective. It is not subjective. It is not experiential. But it's by faith and faith alone in what Christ did. And seven, only by faith in the doing and dying of Christ can the claims of the Ten Commandments upon us be satisfied. That is correct. Only by his doing and his die can the claims of the Ten Commandments be satisfied. B is wrong. By the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, we can fully satisfy the claims of the Ten Commandments. No! That's saying you can reach perfection. But even if you do reach perfection, what about all the sin that's behind? Again, it's infused grace. Instead of justified by faith alone, apart from works, any works I can do or any works God would do in me, justified by faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary. And God puts the righteousness of Christ in my sinful account. That is the biblical doctrine. Today, during the question period, someone asked, asked the question, what about the modern movements today? How do we deal with these modern movements, warning our people against them? And why is it in, that, that people are enamored with so many of these modern movements? And the questioner names several of them. I'll not name them. But so many modern movements that have some weak doctrine. And so many of these modern movements are weak when it comes to justification. I challenge you sometime to go to a religious gathering. I don't care what religious gathering it is. Go to a religious gathering, a Christian religious gathering, an orthodox, evangelical Christian gathering, and ask people, stand out of the hallway with a microphone and a tape recorder and ask them, tell me what justification is. And I don't care how loud they have sung or how much they claim to love Jesus, the average Christian gathering, you will not get a clear understanding of justification by faith alone. And the question was, what do we do about these? Well, you know, I'm convinced that people will continue to be enamored with falsehood until they know the truth. And let me illustrate that. And I close. When I was a sophomore at Clayton High School,